You are listening to Shooting Hitler, the Swiss Assassin, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio-only episode for War Stories with Mark Felton. Berchtesgaden is a pretty little Bavarian town located just across the Austrian border. During the Nazi period, the town was reserved for the most loyal party members and was in effect a private Nazi sanctuary high in the mountains. Around 30 kilometres south of Salzburg in Austria, Berchtesgaden is overlooked by Germany's third highest mountain, the 2,713 metre Watzmann, and the nearby Kelstein Mountain, 1,835 metres, affording breathtaking and beautiful views across wooded and pastoral valleys set against a backdrop of high, craggy granite mountains. Hitler was drawn to this landscape. Hitler had first visited the area in the early 1920s. Eventually he rented and then purchased a house of his own that came to be called the Berghof. This was Hitler's private home, and he was intensely proud of having purchased and extended the property courtesy of the royalties from his book Mein Kampf. The Berghof, where before the war Hitler would spend six months of every year, held a special place in his heart. Throughout the early years, during the many periods he spent on the Obersalzberg, Hitler enjoyed an almost carefree lifestyle. The Obersalzberg was the one place that Hitler regularly visited where the security, though tight, was not airtight. The entire Hitler complex was simply too large and geographically challenging to guard to the same degree of thoroughness as at Hitler's other headquarters, notably the Reich Chancellery in Berlin and later the Wolf's Lair in East Prussia. And Hitler's own behaviour at the Obersalzberg actually increased the risk to his personal security. Hitler's aversion to being publicly guarded was particularly acute at this, his most private home, leading to more than one plan to kill him. Aside from Hitler, several other senior Nazis also had clo houses close to the Berghof. These included Martin Bormann, Hitler's private secretary and head of the Nazi Party Chancellery, Hermann Göring, head of the German Air Force, and Albert Speer, Hitler's personal architect and also later Minister of Armaments Production. There was a large SS detachment in battalion strength with its own barracks, and also Hitler's RSD, or Reich Sicherheitsdienst, personal security detail of 19 heavily armed bodyguards. In the early days of his dictatorship, security around Hitler's house was considerably more relaxed than during the war years. Hitler and his entourage often used public paths through the nearby forests, normally accompanied by a few members of his inner circle and three or four RSD officers. He would take tea at the Muslanakopf Tea House, a smaller mountain peak, and then be driven home in a low-key Volkswagen, a marked departure from the usual giant armoured Mercedes used elsewhere. Naturally, these excursions often brought him face to face with his adoring public. Until 1937, up to 2,000 people a day gathered at the security point near the Berghof to see Hitler as he left on a regular afternoon stroll between 3 and 4 p.m. The risks to his personal security were obvious, should a member of the crowd have been bent on assassination. In November 1937, Johann Rattenhuber, the RSD officer charged with Hitler's personal protection, was particularly worried after Hitler ordered the number of Leibstandarte SS sentries around his property to be reduced, as he particularly disliked being visibly guarded. A further problem was that the entrances through the outer security ring were not guarded by the SS, but by civilian volunteers instead, called Arbeitsposten, or workers' sentries, who lacked the authority to stop and search people approaching Hitler's domain. Rattenhuber requested that all three checkpoints be taken over by the RSD. The security arrangements at the Berghof in the late 1930s still had some way to go before they could be described as completely satisfactory. This was evidenced by the case of Maurice Bavaud, a 22-year-old Swiss student who took it upon himself in October 1938 to kill Hitler. Crossing the border into Germany, Bavaud, who was armed with a 6.35mm pistol and ammunition and a copy of Mein Kampf, initially attempted to stalk Hitler in Berlin 
but swiftly discovered that the Führer was hundreds of kilometers south on the Obersalzberg. When he arrived at Berchtesgaden in late October, Bavode quietly and unobtrusively questioned locals about Hitler's security and itinerary, but he discovered that Hitler had moved once again, this time north to Munich in preparation for the Bierhol Putsch Memorial Parade, an annual Nazi pilgrimage. During this event, Hitler would be at his most exposed, walking with the other senior Nazis along roads crammed with spectators to lay a wreath at the Feldherrnhalle, where the Reichswehr had bloodily stopped Hitler's revolution in its tracks in 1923. At this location, a handful of aim shots from the large crowd might just have been possible. So why did Bavode decide to kill Hitler? Well, Bavode was a rather strange individual. Born in Neuchâtel, Switzerland in 1916, he had studied at a Catholic seminary in France and was a devout anti-communist. He had fallen under the influence of a certain Marcel Gerboet, the leader of the anti-communist group he had joined. Gerboet claimed to be a member of the Romanov dynasty of Imperial Russia. It seems that Bavode believed Gerboet's claims that if communism was defeated in Russia, Gerboet would himself ascend the imperial throne. Bavode believed that killing Hitler would somehow help this plan come to fruition. Incredibly, considering whose house it was, Bavode was able to slip into the woods near Hitler's Berghof and spend two days practicing his shooting without being arrested. In 1938, only a small security zone surrounded the Berghof, with many of the valley's properties still in private hands. But it was nonetheless remarkable that repeated gunshots did not alert either the SS or civilian guards to Bavode's presence. Even more incredibly, Bavode struck up a conversation with Captain Karl Deckert, one of the police officers in charge of security at the old Reich Chancellery in Berlin, and security officer to Dr. Hans Lammers, who was at the time State Secretary and Chief of the Chancellery. The policeman had overheard Bavode discussing his admiration for Hitler and his desire to meet him with two French language instructors. Deckert, who spoke French, was at the Berghof with his boss and told Bavode, thinking that he was a fan, that if he wanted to see Hitler, the best place would be during the upcoming parade in Munich. The only way he could meet the Führer was by a personal letter of introduction from a senior Nazi official. On the 31st of October, Bavode arrived in Munich, rented a room, and plotted the route of the forthcoming march on a tourist map, hoping to discover a suitable ambush point. He decided that one of the invitation-only grandstands near the Marienplatz afforded the closest vantage point of Hitler as he walked along the road. Bavode obtained a ticket by pretending to be a Swiss reporter. Still concerned about his shooting ability, he took himself off to a quiet forested area, 40 kilometers from Munich, to practice, again without raising suspicion. The 9th of November was a cold and clear day, perfect parade weather. Dressed in a heavy overcoat and with a pistol tucked into his pocket, Bavode made his way through the huge crowd to his seat. The entire road was festooned with Nazi flags and bunting. The crowd was restless and excited, and the route was lined with large, brown-uniformed SA men. Suddenly, a shout went up. The Führer is coming. The crowd rose almost as one. Bavode, in the front row, stood with one hand thrust deep into his coat pocket, gripping the pistol tightly. His heart was racing. Then the marchers came into view. Bavode stared in scant disbelief. Hitler was not in the middle of the first rank of marchers, as he had assumed. Instead, he was on the opposite side of the road from the Swiss assassin. The distance was about 15 metres, twice the range that Bavode had trained himself to be comfortable with. Should he take the shot anyway? His mind raced, a dreadful uncertainty rooting him to the spot. No, he decided, he would probably miss and that would be the end of him. Wait for another opportunity. His hand released the concealed pistol and he watched as Hitler disappeared out of sight around a corner. Bavode decided to follow Captain Deckard's advice about a letter of introduction, and rather foolishly forged one from French Foreign Minister Pierre Flandon. 
Travelling back to Berchtesgaden by train, Bavod rented a taxi to take him up to the Berghof. He was prevented from entering the security zone by SS guards, who told them that Hitler was still in Munich. Bavod rushed back to the station, boarded a train and arrived in Munich around the same time that Hitler was leaving on a train to Berchtesgaden. Nearly out of money, Bavod decided to give up on his plan to kill the Führer. Lacking the funds for a train journey to Switzerland, Bavode hid on a train to Paris, where he hoped to obtain travel money from the Swiss embassy. Caught by the conductor, he was handed over to the police in Augsburg. When searched, the police turned up the pistol and the forged letter that Bavode had foolishly kept. He was arrested by the Gestapo, and after extensive interrogation, including torture, Bavode admitted the details of his plot to kill Hitler. The Swiss refused to help him. In fact, they disowned him. The outcome, of course, was quite obvious. On the 14th of May, 1941, Bavode was beheaded in Berlin. In 1938, Bavode could have legally got quite close to the Berghof to have had a chance of shooting Hitler for one of his afternoon strolls. By the time Bavode was executed, no fan would be permitted anywhere near Hitler's house. Martin Bormann solved the Führer's security problems by steadily buying up all of the private properties in the valley, often intimidating farmers into selling. Through such methods, the security zone around the Berghof was extended until eventually the entire area was under Bormann's personal authority. However, the case of Bavode was not to be the last time an assassin decided to attempt to kill Hitler at the Berghof. In fact, a much more elaborate plan was put together by the British, codenamed Operation Foxley. But that's a tale for another time. Many thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.